Welcome to Virtual APSA 2021 Plenary Session 1. I'm one of your moderators, Dr. Aaron Garvey from Phoenix Children's Hospital. And I am Dr. Edward Taggy from Loma Linda University Children's Hospital. And I am Dr. Drew Rideout from Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital. We are all members of your 2021 APSA Program Committee, and we are delighted to present these nine abstracts for you in the plenary session. Our first abstract will be presented by Dr. Nathan Rubel Kaba from the University of Michigan. His presentation is entitled, A Contrast Challenge is Safe in Children with Adhesive Bowel Obstruction, a Multi-Institutional Retrospective Review. Hi everyone, I'm Nate Rubel Kaba and I'm a research fellow at the University of Michigan. Adhesive small bowel obstructions are a well-known cause of morbidity in children following abdominal surgery. Traditionally, the treatment has been gastric decompression, bowel rest, fluid resuscitation, and electrolyte re replacement. However, over the last two decades, the use of water-soluble contrast agents in the management of small bowel obstructions has become well-established in the adult literature, given their ability to predict the success of non-operative management. A contrast challenge is performed when a patient presents with a small bowel obstruction that qualifies for non-operative management. After a period of gastric decompression, the patient is given the contrast and will wait a period of eight to 10 hours after which an abdominal x-ray is obtained. Contrast in the colon is considered having passed their contrast challenge and, and after the patient demonstrates clinical improvement with tolerance of a regular diet, they are discharged from the hospital. For those who still don't have contrast in their colon, after a repeat abdominal x-ray at 24 hours, they are considered to have failed their contrast challenge and will be taken to surgery for exploration. Despite this practice in adults, limited data exists with regards to safety and use of a contrast challenge in the pediatric population. Yet, multiple pediatric institutions have adopted contrast challenge algorithms. Therefore, we sought to evaluate the safety of a water-soluble contrast challenge in children presenting with an adhesive small bowel obstruction. For this study, we performed a retrospective review of all children undergoing a contrast challenge across five children's hospitals over a period of eight years. Our primary outcome was any complication related to contrast administration, and by group consensus, a complication rate less than 5% would be considered safe to use a contrast challenge for clinical practice. Contrast-associated complications were defined as major and minor complications, with major compl complications including aspiration, pneumonia, anaphylaxis, cardiovascular complications, and renal failure. Minor complications included urticaria, dyspnea, and worsening abdominal pain. Overall, 82 children underwent a contrast challenge. 57 initially passed their challenge, of which 53 had clinical improvement and were successfully discharged. There were 25 who failed and were taken to surgery. The four that failed to completely resolve were also taken to surgery. There was a significant age difference between the two groups, with those passing the challenge being a median of seven years older. However, there were no differences between each age group. Our, co our cohort included patients affected with neurologic and pulmonary com comorbidities, which were present in over 30% of our patients. The contrast agents used were institution-specific. All had relatively similar osmolality, with dilute gastrographin being the most commonly utilized agent. There were no major or minor complications in the study, and with a 0% complication rate, and a confidence interval of 0 to 3.6%, this was significantly below our preset acceptable complication rate of 5%. There were no mortalities in either group. The group that failed their contrast challenge had a significantly longer hospital stay by five days. A total of six patients were readmitted within 30 days for a recurrent small bowel obstruction. In our contingency table for the contrast challenge, we compared medical versus surgical small bowel obstructions. Contrast in the colon was considered a positive test and a bowel obstruction that resolved without surgery, a medical small bowel obstruction was considered positive, uh, disease positive. With these considerations, the contrast challenge has a sensitivity of 100%, specificity of 86%, negative and positive predictive values of 100% and 93% respectively. Predicting who will be successful with non-operative management remains challenging. However, in our review of 82 patients, which is the largest to date in children, 
we demonstrated that a contrast challenge is safe, effective, and highly predictive in children and provides informative data for the surgeon to use in their clinical decision making. Thank you very much, and please reach out if you have any questions. Thank you, Dr. Rubalcaba. The invited discussant for this paper is Dr. Laura Goodman from Loma Linda University. Hi, I'm Laura Goodman. I'm the Pediatric Surgery Fellow at Loma Linda University Children's Hospital. And I'm here today um, with Nate Rubalcaba to talk about um, his abstract. The first question I wanna ask is, um, if you could tell us some more about the four patients in your study who had to cross over um, after they initially passed the gastrographin challenge with improvement and then failed to improve. Um, when did they cross over? Was the initial diagnosis correct? And um, additionally, there were two who fell out of the algorithm. Can you tell us about the timing of the failure of those particular patients? Yeah, I'd be more than happy to go through those, uh, those patients. Um, the four patients who initially passed their contrast challenge, um, they had their eight-hour abdominal x-ray and they weren't considered having passed their, uh, their contrast challenge to the 24 hour uh, x-ray, um, they were given a diet and all four of them failed to improve clinically from a diet standpoint. And at that point, two of them ended up going to surgery within 24 hours of their second x-ray. And the other two uh, went to surgery a few days later. Their diagnosis of a adhesive small bowel obstruction essentially stayed, or stayed the same uh, after the operation, no bowel was resected and it was just a lysis of adhesions. Uh, with regards to the two patients who um, drop, fell out of the algorithm, really they had a change in their clinical uh, presentation. Um, uh, before their 24-hour uh, x-ray, the surgical team felt that they need to go to surgery, and correctly so, they ended up going to the, op going to the operating room, which that I, I want to highlight uh, an, uh, an important part of the uh, contrast protocol um, is really to give the surgeon additional information you know, that, that can help them with their clinical decision-making. And it isn't really meant to supersede clinical judgment. So if the surgeon feels that they need to go to the operating room, then go to the operating room. Got it, thank you. Yeah. Um, another question for you. So um, in other previous studies, um, most of these studies have been done in adults up till this point, but um, Zielinski et al um, in the Journal of Trauma and Acute Care Surgery um, and others have um, previously published about eight hours as a cutoff and found that that uh, time frame was actually um, very sensitive and specific for this algorithm. So why use 24 hours instead of eight? That's actually a very good question. The adult literature is uh, a little mixed with the timing of that x-ray. Um, and you'll, you'll see anywhere from four to 24 hours um, and then when you look at the pediatric literature, unfortunately, there's just not enough literature to be able to give a strong recommendation. And so to the short answer is basically that four of the five institutions actually based their contrast protocol off of a, uh, the University of Chicago's protocol that was published in JPS uh, in 2019. And, that, and the University of Chicago happens to be the fifth, the fifth institution in our study. And so we're, we're actually... Um, using a similar protocol in our prospective multi-institutional study with the MWPSC. And so we'll hopefully have more information to report on uh, after the study has been completed. Very good, thanks so much. All right, thank you. Thank you, Drs. Rubalcava and Goodman. Our next abstract will be presented by Dr. Katherine Colbreth from Boston Children's Hospital. Her presentation is entitled, Surgical Necrotizing Enterocolitis, worsens neurodevelopmental outcomes in extremely low birth weight infants with concomitant intraventricular hemorrhage. Thank you for this opportunity to present. I have no disclosures. Here's a common clinical scenario. You are consulted on this 700 gram infant with perforated necrotizing enterocolitis, and you perform a boparotomy and bowel resection. This infant also has a head ultrasound showing severe intraventricular hemorrhage another disease that primarily affects preterm infants, occurring in 22% of infants with surgical neck. The parents are now asking about prognosis. We know that each of these diseases is independently associated with increased mortality and neurodevelopmental disability, but we don't know what happens when they occur together. Previous work from our group showed that in infants with IVH, the presence of surgical neck confers an additional risk of mortality 
compared to IVH without NEC. Our aim in this study was to evaluate survivors to determine if the coexistence of NEC and IVH conferred additional risk of neurodevelopmental disability compared to the risk associated with either disease separately. The Vermont Oxford Network, or VON, is a nonprofit collaboration dedicated to improving the quality of neonatal intensive care worldwide. Their database includes over 90% of very low birth weight infants in the country. This study, which was part of an ongoing collaboration with VON, was a retrospective review of prospectively collected data from 55 centers. Extremely low birth weight, or ELBW, was defined as birth weight 401 to 1,000 grams, or gestational age 22 to 27 weeks. The follow-up time period was between age 16 and 26 months, corrected for prematurity. A diagnosis of neck required at least one clinical and one radiographic finding. Surgical neck was defined as receiving either laparotomy or peritoneal drainage. Grade 1 to 2 was mild IVH, and grade 3 to 4 was severe IVH. The primary outcome of this study was severe neurodevelopmental disability, which was defined as having any one of these criteria listed here at the time of follow-up. Our secondary outcomes were medical needs after discharge and rehospitalization rates. A generalized estimating equations model was used to determine the adjusted risk ratio of developing severe disability in infants with medical or surgical neck compared to those without neck stratified by severity of IVH. 5,870 infants were evaluated in follow-up. Comorbidities were similar between those who were evaluated and those who were not. As expected based on prior data, the incidence of neck and particularly surgical neck increased as IVH severity increased. In all three IVH groups, infants with surgical neck had increased disability compared to those without neck. Medical neck did not pose a significantly increased risk. The highest risk was in those with both severe IVH and surgical neck with a staggering 75% demonstrating severe disability at two year follow-up. Patients with severe IVH required the most medical support after discharge, most commonly in the form of motor and speech support. Rates of rehospitalization were highest in surgical neck and they increased as IVH severity increased. Respiratory illness was the most common reason for rehospitalization across all groups. One of the limitations of this study is loss to follow-up. Additionally, in those who had only primary peritoneal drainage, surgical neck is not definitively differentiated from spontaneous intestinal perforation. In conclusion, surgical neck does confer an additional risk of severe disability in ELBW infants with concomitant IVH, but this association was not seen in those with medical neck. These data can help providers set expectations for the parents regarding the extent of medical care that will likely be required in the first two years of life and beyond. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Dr. Colbreth. The invited discussant for this paper is Dr. Chris Snyder from Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital. Thank you, Dr. Colbreth, for that really interesting presentation. I do have a couple questions for you. Um, okay. First of all, since the main value of the study is really for um, prognosis and counseling of families, did you look at temporal trends in your primary outcome of neurodevelopmental disability? You know, the study covered a, a seven-year period, so it's possible that over that period of time that, you know, outcomes improve just due to general improvements in care. So it'd be important to have the most up-to-date information to counsel these families. Uh, certainly, I agree. It would be um, important to provide the most up-to-date um, information for families. We chose this seven-year study period starting in 2011 because uh, that's when the developmental assessment that we use <clears throat> switched from the Bailey 2 to the more current Bailey 3 and 4 scales. So as we accrue more data using these newer scales, um, a temporal assessment of the incidence of disability would certainly be an excellent idea um, for an analysis to pursue. Very good. Um, you, you also talk a little bit about how, um, <clears throat> excuse me, patients that have spontaneous intestinal perforation may get lumped in with uh, um, patients that have neck. This may be a little bit of misclassification um, in your data among the babies that only got a drain. Um, did you consider any kind of sensitivity analysis to exclude the uh, drain babies and see if that, if that changed your outcomes at all? 
Uh, so that's a good question. We did not do a separate analysis excluding the PPD patients for this study. Uh, we chose to stick with the same Vaughn definition for surgical neck that we've used um, in our previous study where we evaluated disability in infants with neck. Uh, this study builds on that prior data by adding the IVH component. So um, using the same definition as before allows us to compare the results of this study to our prior study uh, where we did not stratify by IVH severity. The PPD only group um, of note is a mixed cohort. So it contains both SIP and neck patients. And it's a dichotomous group that's um, either very well or very sick. So if we exclude the PPD patients, we're not just excluding SIP, but also the sickest neck patients, uh, which makes it really difficult to interpret any changes in the results that we might find um, after doing that. Um, so because of this limitation in their definition, Vaughn is moving toward a new suspected SIP category in those without a laparotomy to confirm the diagnosis, um, but this new definition is not yet implemented. Got it. And then a uh, final question, just real quick. Um, did you consider looking separately at the, the drain babies versus those who got a laparotomy? You know, there's, there's some emerging preclinical animal data suggesting that uh, maybe we should be more aggressive in, in neck and go in and you know, take out the bowel earlier that's um, necrotic just to, to kind of decrease the systemic inflammatory load and you know, possibly the, the effect on that, that gut-brain interaction. Is that something you, you consider or something you would consider for future? Yeah, that's a great point and definitely something that needs to be evaluated further. Um, this particular study was not really designed to get at that, but uh, we have previously studied that um, data um, and we found there were similar rates of uh, disability between infants who underwent PPD versus laparotomy for surgical neck. Um, of note, there is this uh, NEST trial that's going on, which is a multi-center uh, randomized trial. Um, designed to evaluate exactly that um, outcome. So we look forward to seeing their results. Very good, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Drs. Culbreth and Snyder. And our next abstract in this session will be presented by Mr. George Buse from the Hospital for Sick Children. His presentation is entitled, A Novel Therapy to Reduce Neuroinflammation in Experimental Necrotizing Enterocolitis. Hello, my name is George Buse. I'm a master's student in Dr. Agostino Piero's lab, and today I'll be speaking to you about a novel therapy to reduce neuroinflammation and experimental necrotizing and circulitis. Survivors of neck often have cognitive impairment and structural abnormalities, which isn't explained by prematurity alone. Experimental studies have shown the presence of a gut-brain axis in neck mediated by humoral factors, including T-cells, HMGD1, and pro-inflammatory cytokines. Today's uh, focus will be on HMGD1. We have previously shown that neck intestinal injury induces neuroinflammation in the brain. We found higher numbers of activated microV in the neck brain and upregulation of pro-inflammatory cytokines. Bacterial pattern recognition receptors and toll-like receptors are upregulated in the neck brain. Today's focus will be on TLR4. Dr. Hawkins' group has previously shown that intestinal HMGD1 binds to TLR4 receptors on microglia and activates a pro-inflammatory cascade. Now regulation of intestinal HMGD1 reduces the number of microglia cells, reduces the activity of reactive oxygen species, and restores myelination in the brain. Our collaborators have derived a peptide from folic acid that can interfere between the interaction between the HMGD1 and TLR4, preventing the initiation of a pro-inflammatory cascade. For the first time, we aim to evaluate whether administration of folic acid-derived peptide to neonatal mice with neck attenuates their inflammation. We used a well-established neonatal mouse model of neck where neck is induced by three factors, hypoxia, debauch feeding of hyperosmolar formula, and LPS. Breastfed pumps were used as control. FAD peptide was injected IP daily from P6 to P9. <clears throat> We first confirmed that HMGB1 TLR4 axis is upregulated in the neck brain. We found higher gene expression of TLR4 and higher levels of HMGB1 protein in the neck brain. We next characterized the phenotype after FAD peptide injection. What we found was that FAD peptide reduced the microglia activation in the hippocampus of the neck brain. We also found that FAD peptide induced the proliferation of myelinating cells in the hippocampus of the neck brain. 
We next wanted to confirm that this effect was specific to the HMGU1 TLR4 interaction and not due to other interaction with other TLR4 ligands stemming from bacterial products such as LPS. So then we then injected FAD peptide into mice that had undergone neck induction without LPS. And what we found was that FAD peptide reduced microglia activation, activation in the hippocampus of the neck brain with no LPS. Similarly, FAD peptide increased the proliferation of myelinating cell in the hippocampus of the neck brain with no LPS. HMGB1, when bound to TLR4, initiates the formation of the inflammasome, which further progresses inflammation and inflammatory injury. What we found was that in, after FAD pe peptide injection, FAD peptide reduced the uh, regulation of NLRP3 and reduced the downstream activation and initiation of uh, the inflammasome in the neck brain. It is also important to note that FAD peptide reduced the severity of neck intestinal damage. In summary, there is a gut brain axis in the neck partially mediated by HMGB1. We have found a new folic acid derived peptide that could interfere between the interaction of HMG1 and TLR4, thus inhibiting a poor inflammatory cascade. Studies are underway to assess the effect of FAD peptide on specific nerve cells. This peptide could provide a novel pharmacological approach to prevent neck associated neuroinflammation during the infant management of neck. I would like to thank members of my lab and Dr. Fierro for the support for this research. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Buse. The invited discussant for this paper is Dr. Samir Dadapali from the University of Michigan. Hi, I'm uh, Samir Dadapali. I'm a pediatric surgeon at the University of Michigan. And I'm here with... Uh... Hi, uh, my name is George. I'm a master's student in Dr. Augustino Piero's lab. Um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about my research today. Hey, uh, first question I have for you. That was a very well presented uh, talk on a very important topic. Um, so in order to use the, uh, um, the peptide, um, you have to deliver it every single day. Uh, it seems like as soon as, um, you notice a change, how is that going to be translated when you would eventually use it in a baby? Thank you for that great question. It, um, it's a great, um, point about the translational aspect of this research. Um, so the drug is really meant for um, treating, um, you know, babies who have been confirmed with neck. And essentially, this drug would be part of the infant management of neck, whether it be part of their, um, you know, their feeding or nutrition um, supplemented. Um, and I believe that, you know, this drug um, could be administered um, can be administered and prevent sort of the progression from, you know, mild neck to severe neck. Um, and essentially the drug um, translationally might be needed to be uh, given daily as the half-life is within 12 hours. So um, what we have found is that in the animal model, giving them daily does not produce any significant side effects. So this might um, uh, allow for, you know, translation um, in, in the near future. Great. Um, the second uh, question I had for you was, uh, you had briefly mentioned in your talk that it had some impact on the intestinal cells of the mucosa. Uh, I was wondering if you could uh, uh, expand on that a little bit. Yeah, great. Um, thank you for allowing me to explain more about my research um, into the uh, into the brain as well as into the intestine. So yes, the pups that were injected had a reduced neck severity score, which is based on the histological grading of the uh, intestinal injury. Uh, we also have some preliminary data that um, the drug downregulates the expression of pro-inflammatory cytokines um, IL-6 and TNF-alpha in the intestine of the neck pups. So mechanistically, this drug seems to have an anti-inflammatory effect in the intestine as well. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your questions. Thank you, Mr. Buse and Dr. Gaudapalli. Our next abstract will be presented by Dr. Michelle Callis from Cohen Children's Medical Center at Hofstra Northwell. Her presentation is entitled, Use of Ultrasound as a Diagnostic Adjunct in Cases of Equivocal Necrotizing Enterocolitis as Part of a Structured Diagnostic Algorithm to Reduce Overtreatment. Thank you for allowing me to present my work. I have no disclosures. The diagnosis of necrotizing enterocolitis or NEC is based on clinical and radiographic features. Historically, abdominal radiograph has been the gold standard imaging modality for the diagnosis of NEC. 
Pathognomonic radiographic findings for neck include portal venous gas and pneumatosis, as depicted in the right by the blue and red arrows, respectively. However, sensitivity for pneumatosis of radiograph is relatively low, especially in less severe cases of disease. Therefore, equivocal radiographic findings can lead to unnecessary treatment, including needless antibiotic exposure in neonates. Some centers have used abdominal ultrasound as an adjunctive diagnostic tool in cases of equivocal neck. Some studies have shown increased or earlier identification of pneumatosis with the utilization of ultrasound. In addition to having higher sensitivity for pneumatosis, the benefits of ultrasound also include lack of radiation, portability, and the ability to assess dynamic aspects of bowel integrity. However, the use of ultrasound in the diagnosis of neck remains limited, as many clinicians have minimal experience using this Im imaging modality for this application. At our institution, we implemented a diagnosis and management algorithm that included the use of ultrasound in cases of equivocal neck. In this study, we sought to examine the sensitivity of ultrasound to identify the presence or absence of pneumatosis in patients with clinical suspicion for neck, but where abdominal radiographic findings were equivocal. We sought to examine the effect of integration of ultrasound as a diagnostic adjunct on, on limiting overdiagnosis of neck and reducing unnecessary antibiotic treatment. To do this, we conducted a retrospective review and included all patients with clinical suspicion for neck, but with equivocal radiographic findings. All patients underwent both abdominal radiograph and ultrasound as dictated by our algorithm. During our study duration, we found 54 patients with clinical suspicion for neck, but with equivocal radiographic findings. 22 of these patients have definitive pneumatosis found on ultrasound. One patient had equivocal ultrasound findings, and 31 patients had definitive absence of pneumatosis on ultrasound. We then sought to correlate these ultrasound findings with a final diagnosis of neck. Patients were deemed to have a diagnosis of neck based on documentation by the clinical team. Ultimately, 29 patients within our cohort were deemed to have a positive diagnosis of neck. These patients included all 22 patients with presence of pneumatosis on ultrasound, representing a 75.9% sensitivity of ultrasound to detect the presence of pneumatosis in patients diagnosed as positive for neck. Neck positive patients also included one patient with equivocal ultrasound findings and six patients with definitive absence of pneumatosis on ultrasound. All seven of these patients were determined to have a positive diagnosis of neck due to persistence of symptoms and or clinical deterioration. 25 patients were determined to be neck negative. All 25 of these patients were found to have definitive absence of pneumatosis on ultrasound, representing 100% sensitivity of ultrasound to identify the absence of pneumatosis in patients ultimately negative for disease. Traditionally, all 54 of these patients with equivocal radiographic findings would have been treated with full course antibiotics for presumed neck. We sought to examine whether ultrasound findings demonstrating the absence of pneumatosis could reduce unnecessary use of antibiotics. 16 of 31 patients with definitive absence of pneumatosis were on ultrasound were not placed on antibiotics. Of patients with absence of pneumatosis on ultrasound treated with antibiotics, duration was significantly shorter than patients positive for pneumatosis on ultrasound. Of the patients without pneumatosis on ultrasound that were treated with antibiotics, six patients were treated with full course antibiotics for clinically diagnosed neck as discussed previously. The remaining patients were started on antibiotics empirically prior to ultrasound results and received abbreviated courses of antibiotics due to negative ultrasound findings. Therefore, we were able to show that ultrasound has increased sensitivity in identifying either the presence or absence of pneumatosis in neck positive or neck negative patients, respectively. Ultrasound use guided clinical decision-making by the physician team by assisting in establishing a diagnosis of neck. Absence of pneumatosis on ultrasound was associated with reduced antibiotic usage and durations and duration in patients negative for neck. Thank you, and I will take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Callis. The invited discussant for this paper is Dr. Marcus Jarbo from the University of Michigan. Thank you, Dr. Callis, for the really interesting, nice uh, presentation. Um, my first question is, is uh, what were the, were there what were or were there um, criteria, ultrasound criteria for the diagnosis of neck? Thank you for your question. Um, in our study, we just used the presence of pneumatosis as criteria for um, pneumatosis. Although ultrasound has the capability to look at other functional and dynamic aspects of the bowel, which can help inform the diagnosis of neck, 
Um, using this modality at our institution is still relatively new. And so not all, all of our radiologists consistently commented on um, other aspects of bowel integrity or bowel thickness. Pneumatosis was the only finding that they consistently commented on in all of our studies. So for that reason, we only used pneumatosis as a criteria. Great. Um, uh, when we get ultrasound, uh, when our neck patients, a lot of times we see portal venous gas, um, of course, portal venous gas on abdominal film kind of uh, signals a little bit more severe a neck sometimes. Uh, how often was portal venous gas seen on your ultrasound studies or was it commented on and, and were the outcomes any different on those patients? Sure, thank you. So um, our patients were initially uh, screened by having equivocal abdominal uh, x-ray findings. So certainly patients who had portal venous gas on abdominal x-ray would not be included in this study because that's a pretty definitive finding. Um, and in terms of portal venous gas identified on ultrasound, it was also not really consistently identified or commented on. And so for that reason, we did not collect that data and it was solely a, a pneumatosis that we were focusing on. Perfect. Great. And then my last, uh, last question is, um, do you guys have a standard treatment for your, do you have a standardization for your treatment of neck or ties and so currently we do not have a standardized institutional uh, algorithm for our treatment of uh, NAC, but uh, this abstract was part of introducing a new algorithm that does include ultrasound um, as part of the diagnostic workup for NEC in order to make a more standardized way in which we treat these patients. Um, you know, part of this abstract came out of trying to induce antibiotic stewardship um, and, you know, limiting the amount of antibiotics that are used in patients who don't have neck, who are just empirically put on these things without uh, great uh, diagnostic data. So we have an algorithm that we're working on that we're hoping to implement in a more formal way. And hopefully we can do more prospective studies once that algorithm is formally in place. Great, perfect. Well, thanks a lot for the really interesting abstract and your work. Um, and uh, that concludes our, our discussion on this. Thank you, Drs. Callis and Jarbo. Our next abstract in this session will be presented by Dr. Robert Reddick from Kaiser Permanente Los Angeles Medical Center. His presentation is entitled, Is Same-Day Discharge Possible Following the Nust Repair for Pectus Excavatum? Hello, everyone. My name is Luke Reddick, and I'm a surgical resident at Kaiser Permanente Los Angeles Medical Center. And thank you for the opportunity for me to present our research on Pectus Excavatum and Same-Day Discharge at APSA 2021. Pectus excavatum affects one in about 400 patients. It has a male predominance at about a four to one ratio, and the NUS procedure is the gold standard for fixation. Historically, the NUS procedure has been associated with a significant amount of pain, and this pain leads to increased hospital lengths of stay, which increase hospital costs. Now, with the introduction of intercostal nerve cryoablation, this has helped patients with their pain and also has helped to decrease the length of stay. Our study looked at the NUS procedure with intercostal nerve cryoablation and an enhanced recovery after surgery protocol in addition to intercostal nerve block. And this was compared to the NUS procedure with intercostal nerve cryoablation alone. The intercostal nerve cryoablation was performed at sites T3 through T7 on both sides of the chest. And historically, as we know from some of our previous papers, patients have been in pain for about 24 hours after this intercostal nerve cryoablation uh, because it sometimes takes that long for the full effects to kick in. We hypothesized that using an enhanced recovery after surgery protocol, in addition to intercostal nerve block, that this would help them with their pain. So what we did with the intercostal nerve block was we used bupivacaine proximal to the site of intercostal nerve cryoablation, and we thought that this would help with perioperative pain. Our primary outcome was same-day discharge, and secondary outcomes included returns to the emergency department, returns to urgent care, returns to the operating room, a cost analysis, and an analysis of inpatient and outpatient opioid use. We had 15 patients in both groups. All patients were male and the patient characteristics were similar in both groups with regards to Haller index, pectus correction index, age, and ethnicity. 
The follow-up in the INB group was 7.5 months, whereas the follow-up in the INC group was 29 months. We found that 10 out of 15 patients were able to be discharged on post-operative day zero, with the remaining five in the INB group being able to be discharged on post-operative day one. None of the patients in the INC group were discharged prior to post-operative day two. The length of stay was decreased in the INB group at 12 hours compared to 58 hours. The OR time was the same in both groups. The cost was statistically significantly less in the INB group compared to the INC group. And the amount of opioids that were used were statistically significantly less in the INB group than the INC group. We found that 10 patients in the INB group never even used opioids after discharge, whereas five, the remaining five, used them sparingly. All patients had resolution of symptoms. Now the complication, we looked at Foley catheter removal and replacement. We looked at pneumothorax requiring chest tube placement. We looked at infections, surgical site, and also UTIs. And we looked at returns to urgent care. And none of those were different between the group, groups. In the INB group, though, um, zero returned to the ED, whereas in the INC group, four returned to the emergency department. So we concluded that the NUTS procedure and intercostal nerve cryoablation with enhanced recovery after surgery protocol and intercostal nerve block was better than just the NUS procedure and intercostal nerve cryoablation. So same day discharge is possible in pectus excavatum patients. If you would like a copy of the ERATS protocol, please email me below at robert.l.reddick at kp.org. And thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Dr. Reddick. The invited discussant for this paper is Dr. Lisa McMahon from the Phoenix Children's Hospital. Thank you very much, Dr. Luke Reddig, for your really interesting talk on discharging patients safely the same day after a NUS procedure. Changing protocols is difficult, and especially with NUS patients, the families do a lot of research, talk to other families, find out kind of what the best practices are. What did your group do in order to prepare the patients for this same day discharge? Yeah, that's a great question. So we had a preoperative appointment uh, with the patients and their families, and they met with one of our nurse practitioners first. At that same visit, they would also see one of our surgeons. And we used this time to set expectations for the patients and their families. This included teaching them physical therapy exercises, incentive spirometer use, and also talking about the types of pain medications that these patients would be on pre-op, uh, during the operation and after the operation. So it was a kind of a comprehensive visit. Great. Now, did all of your patients live locally? Were, they, were there any patients that lived outside of your catchment area? So this was uh, also really important for us, actually. All of our patients lived uh, to, close to the hospital, at least within driving distance. And so it was really important that if patients had complications and that they needed to go to the emergency department or urgent care, that they actually would able, were able to come close to uh, the institution where we actually performed the procedure. So our nurse practitioner would call them the next day if it were after hours and set up either a phone appointment or an in-person appointment so that these patients wouldn't be lost. Great. Now, cryotherapy has really decreased everybody's opioid use and length of stay, and doing adjuvant therapies during the procedure is also really important. I like this um, intercostal nerve block that you guys did. Now, who performed the nerve block? Was it the surgeons or the anesthesiologists? Did you, were you able to look at it directly um, with the thoracoscope, and uh, did it increase the amount of time? Yeah, those are all great questions. So our surgeons were actually ones that performed the intercostal nerve block, and this was performed uh, approximately to the site of the intercostal nerve cryoablation. It was performed on both sides, and it was performed with direct visualization. Operative time was slightly increased in our intercostal nerve block group, but overall, there was no statistically significant difference. I'm very interested in your ARIS protocol, and I'm wondering which part of the protocol do you think actually contributed the most to successful same-day discharge? Yeah, that's a great question. So as you can see on the screen is our ARIS protocol, and one of the main things that we thought actually helped was the intercostal nerve block. We have hypothesized previously that the intercostal nerve cryoblation actually takes around a day for uh, patients to fully feel the effects. And we've noticed previously that patients 
um, had a lot of pain in their first 24 hours. So we hypothesized that if we injected local anesthetic proximally to the site of the intercostal nerve cryoablation, that this would help with the pain that these patients were feeling. In terms of opioid use, how were you guys able to quantify the amount of opioids actually used? So it was mostly patient and parent reported. So when the patients would come back to the uh, office, we would ask them specifically how much opioids you used. Um, and pretty remarkably, most of the patients in our intercostal nerve block group never even used opioids upon discharge. That's excellent. That's good education there. Were you able to get any information in terms of patient satisfaction concerning same-day discharge? Yeah, that's a great question as well. So on our post-operative visits uh, with our nurse practitioner and our surgeons, the patients and their families were very thankful for uh, being able to be discharged on post-operative day zero. They were thankful to be able to go home and sleep in their own beds. And I think another factor that contributed to them being able to leave was the COVID-19 pandemic. And so we hypothesized that maybe there was a little bit extra motivation for patients and their parents to leave the hospital uh, due to the pandemic. But all the patients were thankful and we we were happy with the success of our protocol. Excellent. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Drs. Reddick and McMahon. Our next abstract will be presented by Dr. Harsha Ramaraju from the Georgia Institute of Technology. His presentation is entitled Computational Design of a Novel Bioreabsorbable Sleeve Device for Esophageal Atresia Repair. Thank you, ABSA, for the opportunity to present our work at this year's plenary session. We have no disclosures. Postoperative and astomotic complications are commonplace following neonatal esophageal atresia repair. Based on several multicenter studies, leaks, strictures, and recurrent fistula often require additional procedures, prolonged hospitalization, and result in long-term morbidity. There's a critical need for novel treatment strategies to facilitate more effective surgical repair in these children. The purpose of this study was to computationally design and evaluate a novel bioresorbable external scaffold device aimed at improving anastomotic healing through multiple mechanisms, including reduction of anastomotic tension, delivery of radial tension, scaffold functionalization to promote angiogenesis, and a mechanical barrier. To develop computational esophageal models, tissues were sectioned and experimentally tested at 37 degrees in saline under physiological loading ranges. The mechanical tests were fit to computational models using nonlinear mathematical equations. Material constants highlighted here in the red box were derived from these equations. These material constants were applied to a two-layer cylinder model describing the mucosal and muscle layers of the esophagus. We then created a 40 millimeter gap in the esophagus and applied body forces equivalent to experimentally tested values to determine retraction forces at the anastomosis site. We see agreement with experimentally measured values from prior investigations utilizing esophageal tissues from infant cadavers. The chart also identifies the nonlinear increase in anastomotic force as a function of gap distance and indicates previously identified safe forces above which leakage was observed, indicated here by the red arrow. Acceptable body forces from the prior retraction model were used as inputs to determine strain energy at the anastomosis site. Varying suture spacing, type, and bite revealed that increasing suture bite from 1.25 millimeters to 6.25 millimeters reduced strain energy and leakage at the anastomosis. This model also highlighted the need for a device to reduce anastomotic tension. To address this, we developed an esophageal sleeve comprised of a bioresorbable and biocompatible shape memory polymer, polyglycerol dodecane dioate. The monomers are comprised of intermediates or byproducts of metabolic pathways and degrade by hydrolytic and enzymatic cleavage. Engineering polymer architecture and blending with composites allows us to tune the mechanical properties of the material to align to those of esophageal tissues as shown here in the chart. Additionally, the graphic depicts how the material is a shape memory polymer, which allows us to compress its shape for delivery in minimally invasive procedures and allows it to self-expand to a predetermined permanent shape upon reheating to body temperature. Finally, we've been able to laser machine this material to precision cut suture holes and even micro pattern the surface at the submicron scale, impacting surface roughness and tissue ingrowth. These materials can also be functionalized with bioactive peptides or growth factors that can improve biological activity while still preserving the shape memory and mechanical properties of the underlying substrate. The images here demonstrate the ability to improve cell attachment of endothelial cells and mesenchymal stem cells to the bind materials that may ultimately drive vascularity and improve healing at the anastomosis site. Based on optimal material design parameters, 
prototype sleeves measuring 25 millimeters in length, 10 millimeters in internal diameter, and two millimeters in thickness were applied to esophagus models using 10 rows of proline sutures. We observed a 24% reduction in strain energy density at the anastomosis site with the sleeve compared to without the sleeve. When implanted in vivo, PGD exhibits good tissue and growth after four months and no significant increase in inflammation or fibrosis compared to silicone controls. Both surface and bulk degradation were evident in retrieved implants. Extrapolate, extrapolating mass loss over a four-month time frame suggests complete degradation to, to take place five to six months after implantation. In conclusion, we designed and manufactured a novel external sleeve, functionalized materials to direct cell adhesion, computationally identified designs that reduce anastomotic tension, all warranting further investigation of these devices in preclinical models for esophageal attrition repair. We'd like to thank our lab and funding sources. I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Ramaraju. The invited discussant for this paper is Dr. Christine Fink from Connecticut Children's Medical Center. Hi, I'm Christine Fink. I am the Surgeon in Chief at Connecticut Children's Medical Center, and I have a so strong interest in esophageal attrition. I'm working on models in which to bridge long esophageal gaps. So this abstract was um, great for me to review, um, and I'm very excited to uh, launch into this discussion about it. So thanks for inviting me to be a participant. With that said, I'd like to launch into my first question, which is for the esophageal model prediction, how did you come up with the 40 millimeter gap? The gap length is a programmable variable in our model. Um, we chose a 40 millimeter gap based on an estimated gap length of three vertebral bodies um, in a neonate uh, with a more challenging C-type TEF. Um, <clears throat> the upper pouch typically goes down to T2 and the lower pouch up to T5. Since um, anatomic studies suggest mean vertebra height are about 13 millimeters in length, that, put, that puts us right around uh, 40 millimeters. That's fantastic. So it does give us some clinical relevance um, and as to how that uh, gap was uh, determined. My next question is, how is the sleeve applied? In the recording, I saw that there were certain methods and you give holes in the device so that you can put sutures in. But I was trying to understand how exactly it's sutured in place and where you place the sutures. Right, the model is designed um, as a sleeve that is placed over the anastomosis and sutured at the anastomosis and at the ends. Um, but the <clears throat> optimization of suture placement is, is really an area of future study. We, in this particular model, we applied the sleeve using interrupted sutures at every row of suture holes extending into the interface between the muscle and mucosal layer. Uh, the sutures themselves were modeled as nonlinear springs that carry tension but do not compress with the material parameters. And uh, really, the, uh, again, the optimization of the suture placement, the anastomotic suture bite based on varying gap geometries, um, and, and in conjunction with the design of the device, these are all uh, areas of future study to uh, uh, reduce that anastomotic tension. So my question then is, is that um, the way I understood it is that you have to put the two ends of the esophagus together first, mm -hmm. and then you put the sleeve over it, and then you put the extra sutures on it to help decrease the tension on the anastomosis. Am I interpreting exactly. that correctly? Right. Excellent. All right. My next um, question uh, was, is the purpose of the sleeve to decrease tension on the anastomosis, which we just uh, stated? Because in your presentation, you're talking about the suture bite, and the bigger the bite, you had a decrease in strain. But when you applied this um, sleeve design, you decreased the strain by 15.5%. Can you talk more about the suture bite and the strain? Sure, yes. Um, so the purpose of the sleeve was to decrease uh, anastomotic tension. But in, in addition to that, it was really to decrease the tension and the strain at the suture site, as well as the strain energy density. The strain energy density, which is um, the metric we use to compare across different designs, um, and different uh, anastomotic techniques um, relates to really the cumulative tension over that distance. So it's a it's more of a cumulative metric of the, of the tension over that uh, distance of uh, strain. Thank you. That makes more sense. My last question um, is is that you discuss the ability to bind substances to the PGD that you're using to enhance cell adherence. Can you talk more on that? And I imagine future studies are going to be focused on that. 
Yeah, yes. Yeah. So we functionalized the surface to incorporate cell adhesive peptides in the study. This can potentially function in two ways, improving cell attachment and jumpstarting the healing process at the anastomosis site, or improving delivery of regenerative cell populations in later generations of the material. Um, in addition to binding these sequences, uh, the underlying technology allows us to safely bind and deliver uh, bioactive factors like growth factors that are able to promote vascularization and tissue healing as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ramaraju and Fink. Our next abstract in this session will be presented by Dr. Kathleen LaRusso from Montreal Children's Hospital McGill University Health Center. Her presentation is entitled, Effect of Transanastomotic Feeding Tubes on Anastomotic Strictures in Patients with Esophageal Atresia and Tracheoesophageal Fistula, the Quebec Experience. Hi, this study evaluates the effect of transanastomotic feeding tubes on anastomotic strictures in patients with esophageal atresia and tracheoesophageal fistula. Risk factors for the development of postoperative stricture include anastomotic tension, long gap atresia, leak, gastroesophageal reflux, and more recently, transanastomotic tubes have been implicated. Their use has increased since the 1980s, the rationale being a shorter time to enteral feeds and a shorter duration of postoperative TPN. A recent study from the Midwest Pediatric Surgery Consortium looking at 292 patients in only type C found an increased rate of strictures in the transanastomotic tube group that was almost two times that of those without. Another study from the Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh, also looking um, at EATEF, all types though, but the majority were type C, also found a significant difference between groups. Due to these recent studies implicating transanastomotic feeding tubes, as an independent risk factor for the development of postoperative strictures, Montreal Children's Hospital initiated a moratorium on their use until we evaluated our own outcomes. This study was expanded to include two other centers in our region. Our hypothesis was that, was that transanastomotic tubes increased the rate of postoperative strictures following EA and TEF repair. Our study population included all type C and type D patients at three university affiliated hospitals in the province of Quebec between, in a 25 year period between 1993 and 2018. We included those that had primary repair within six months of birth and had at least one year follow up. We excluded those with congenital esophageal stenosis with or without atresia, were operated on at another facility or had made major cardiac surgery during the same mission or if there was really insufficient data in the chart to evaluate the primary outcome. Our primary outcome was stricture and which was defined as symptoms with imaging confirmation with either an upper GI or endoscopy at one year. Our secondary outcomes included time to first enteral feeding and duration of postoperative TPN. For a primary outcome of esophageal stricture, univariate and multivariate logistic regression were used to evaluate stricture in those with and without transanastomotic feeding tubes. Adjustments were based on clinical knowledge and also current evidence. Wilcoxian rank sum test was used to compare medians when the data was not normally distributed and a p-value of 0.05 was considered statistically significant. Within our study period, 371 EATF patients uh, were born. Of those, 344 were type C or type D and 244 were included within the three groups. The majority were type C and they were term infants. About 30% had, stricture, had strictures and, and transanastomotic tubes were used in 61% of patients. On univariate analysis, transanastomotic tubes were associated with strictures significantly. On a multivariate analysis, when we adjusted for gestational age, leak, long gap, Nasomotic tension and daily acid suppression, transnasomotic tubes are almost three times higher odds of delibanus stricture compared to those without. On secondary outcomes, we found that days and postoperative TPN were the same. Of note, all patients were on TPN in our study cohort. As expected, duration, uh, number, excuse me, days to first enteral feeding were shorter in the transnasomotic feeding tube group than those without. 
In conclusion, we found that transanastomotic feeding tubes are associated with an increased rate of postoperative strictures, decreased time to enteral feeding, but they do not confer a major benefit in the time on the number of days on postoperative TPN. We'd like to thank APSA for allowing us to present our research and our colleagues in Quebec. Thank you, Dr. LaRusso. The invited discussant for this paper is Dr. Jason Smithers from Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital. A great study, and I think it uh, adds to the literature in several papers uh, that have shown a similar concern about transanastomotic tubes being related to esophageal strictures. I think a couple other nuances to think about are are there different types and or sizes of tubes that people use uh, compared to the baby's size and the esophagus size? Uh, and also just, uh, I think uh, a big thing that goes along with tension is just the tissue quality and the blood flow uh, to the tissue of the anastomosis you're putting together. And then certainly there could be different technical aspects um, of how the anastomosis is constructed. I think there's definitely things that are difficult to control for in these studies, especially when it comes to development of strictures in EA children. Uh, it didn't, I couldn't specifically tell if then every patient that you included as a stricture also got a dilation. Yeah, so um, looking at the numbers, all the children that had a stricture were dilated. Okay. The median number of dilations was four. Um, and there were like in our population, there were also about like 40 or so children that did have this like prophylactic dilation that was done. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and then as far as the, the group of patients that was excluded, mm -hmm. uh, I saw that there were the 30 or so patients excluded because they were considered long gap and then a hundred other patients excluded for either lack of data or some other reason. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, we chose to really focus on type C and type D population because we felt that that was like more of a homogenous group um, than the type A and B um, and obviously H type. So we, a lot of, so about 30, uh, about a third of patients were excluded because they were other types of esophageal atresia. And then there was a third of patients or so that were excluded because of um, they didn't have at least one year of follow-up or there was missing data in the chart. We really felt that yeah. we needed to have like a consistent endpoint um, to really evaluate the data accurately so that um, we wanted everybody to have at least one year of follow-up. So they all had the same time point to like the same amount of time to develop a stricture um, in our analysis. Sure. And I think it's a point of controversy, but it's, I think it's likely the case that some type C patients could also truly be classified as a long gap. Mm -hmm. uh, suffice it to say, not every type C is as easy to put together as the next one. Yeah, correct. We did, we did um, if the patient was classified as a long gap, even when, if it was a type C or type D, we did include that in our analysis and we did try to control that for that um, when we did our multivariate as well. And then one thing I really loved about the study is how it illustrates that the benefit of the transanastomotic tube doesn't seem to be very high in that kids don't get off TPN any quicker. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, is, is a conscious decision that the team is making and you could probably choose a way to advance fees and get off TPN sooner if that was a high priority goal. But nonetheless, um, uh, I don't think it's an important goal to be off TPN in a certain time frame for that type of patient. Um, so it helps clarify what is the actual reason you're placing the tube. Right, if there's not really a huge benefit um, in placing it, um, you start enteral feeds really based on, on TPN and you have the same risk of getting any sort of TPN related complications. Yeah. I think if I could just add a point, that was very interesting actually looking at the trajectory of how things developed over the course of the, the study. Um, you know, both TPN and access to be able to put a baby on TPN changed quite a bit over the last quarter century. I mean, we used to put central lines in every baby who needed TPN, and now we've been putting pick lines for the last couple of decades. And certainly people have a feeling that the morbidity of a pick line is far less than the morbidity of a, of a femoral line or a subclavian or a jugular line in the baby. And then we've also had really TPN that was, um, you know, a, a lot less caustic to the liver, even if it needs to be used for a 
prolonged period of time. So both the morbidity of TPN itself and the morbidity of access, I think have decreased substantially over the last 25 years. And that probably uh, also negated the potential benefit of a transanastomotic tube to some extent. The transanastomotic tube is still one of many nuances that go into to the, the risk of a leak and or a stricture developing long-term. And um, th there remains the issue where certain surgeons may be more likely to use a tube if they're more worried about the anastomosis mm -hmm. and less likely to use a tube if they're less worried about it. I don't think this question will ever be truly answered in a high quality way from retrospective study as multi-center as they can be, but there are a couple of databases. There's one in Australia and the Europeans have an esophageal atresia database, and this would actually be a great question to look at in prospectively collect collected mm -hmm. data. Yeah, no, I agree. But I think that your paper was very elegant and certainly the, the case to leave a tube as a routine, I feel is, uh, is no longer supported. Yeah. Thank you so much for your great feedback. I appreciate it. Thank you, Drs. LaRusso and Smithers. Our next abstract in this session will be presented by Dr. Maeve O'Neill Trudeau from the Centre Hospitalet Universitaire Sainte Justine, Universitaire de Montreal. And I apologize for butchering that. Her presentation is entitled, Implementing a Standardized Gastroschisis Protocol Significantly Increases Primary Bedside Sutureless Closures Without Compromising Closure Success or Early Clinical Outcomes. Today, it is my pleasure to present Implementing a Standardized Gastroschisis Protocol Significantly Increases Primary Bedside Sutureless Closures Without Compromising Closure Success or Early Clinical Outcomes. I have no conflicts of interest to declare. The main points of this presentation are that a NICU pediatric surgery multidisciplinary practice bundle significantly increased bedside NICU gastroschisis closures from 35 to 95% and sutureless closures from 33 to 71%. Median postoperative ventilation days decreased from four days to two days. CHU St. Justine is a high volume gastroschisis center in Montreal that treated 13% of all gastroschisis cases in Canada between 2017 and 2018. Sutureless closures are performed in the absence of intestinal atresia, necrosis, or perforation. The eviscerated contents are reduced into the abdomen and the umbilical flap is used to cover the abdominal defect and then secured in place with steri strips. In 2013, we began implementing a practice bundle that involved the presence of NICU and surgical teams in the delivery room immediate protection of eviscerated intra-abdominal contents with dressings, followed by transfer to NICU, intubation, antibiotic and sedation administration with possible paralysis, rectal irrigation, followed by attempt at immediate sutureless umbilical flap closure for all infants with uncomplicated gastroschisis. Here are our post-reduction guidelines, including extubation as soon as clinically appropriate. We then performed a retrospective review of uncomplicated gastroschisis patients treated at our institution between 2008 and 2019. Patients were divided into two groups, four years pre-implementation, January 2008 to December 2011, and 4.5 years post-implementation, January 2015 to June 2019, separated by a three-year washout period. Patients treated during the washout period were excluded from the analysis because the practice bundle underwent a number of modifications during this time and uptake was not universal among the neonatal and pediatric surgery teams. Neonates, pre-implementation N equals 53 and post-implementation N equals 43 were similar across baseline variables. Regarding results, time to closure less than six hours trended towards increase from 83% to 95%. Successful immediate closure rates were comparable. The proportion of bedside closures increased significantly after protocol implementation, 95% from 35%, as did the proportion of sutureless closures, 71% from 32.5%. Median postoperative mechanical ventilation decreased significantly from four days to two days. Postoperative complications were equivalent. 
after controlling for potential confounding using a multivariate model adjusting for birth weight, gestational age, score for neonatal acute physiology, SNAP2, and gastroschisis prognostic score, infants in the post-implementation group had a 44 times higher odds of undergoing bedside closure and a 7.7 times higher odds of undergoing sutureless closure. In conclusion, implementing a standardized gastroschisis protocol significantly increased the proportion of NICU bedside closures, sutureless flap closures, with nearly three quarters of infants closed immediately with sutureless flap closures, and decreased the duration of mechanical ventilation without increasing postoperative complications. Thank you for this opportunity. I will be happy to take any questions and we would be happy to answer any questions by email as well. Thank you, Dr. Trudeau. The invited discussant for this paper is Dr. Jason Frazier from Children's Mercy, Kansas City. Your abstract was pre and presentation were very well done. And I thank you for taking the time to discuss it today. I do have a couple questions for you. Um, why was there a decrease in ventilation uh, post implementation? Was this due to increased sutures closure alone or was this a concerted effort to work towards extubation? Past? I think it's probably both. I think that Arguably, a fascial closure is more painful than a sutureless closure, and therefore these babies might require increased sedation and analgesia. And I think it's also what happens with a practice bundle that's so wonderful is that the entire team involved in managing the gastroschisis baby is put on the same page and knows that the goal is as early extubation as possible, and so that contributes as well. Excellent. Uh, second question for you is that we found that days on parenteral nutrition did not differ pre and post bundle implementation. Did you examine time to initiation of feeds as well as time to goal feeds? Thank you. So the CAPSNET database, which is what we use, a nationwide uh, Canadian pediatric surgery database, does not have initial feed uh, timing. However, it does have both total parenteral nutrition days and uh, time to goal feeds. So both tracked very similarly, and we decided to use the time to uh, total parenteral nutrition days because this correlates to the central line days of the NICU baby, which is also a very important consideration. Great. And I assume most of your central lines were picks? Yes. Awesome. And I guess a correlation to that question then is, did you examine hospital length to stay between the two groups? We did, and again, it was the, there was no change in pre- and post-bundle implementation. Great. Uh, also, then, it looks like all or some of your patients receive intubation, sedation, paralysis. Has your team attempted to avoid any, any or all of these? I ask this because many babies are able to be closed without intubation or paralysis and using only oral sucrose. Thank you for the question. And it gives me the chance to clarify, not all of our babies are paralyzed. For this practice bundle with the results that we presented, all babies were intubated and sedated. And then the surgical team assessed the bowels and decided whether or not paralysis would be necessary to achieve a successful bedside closure. So I would say that most, many, if not most of our babies did not receive paralysis. It was just part of the uh, bundle. And then Secondly, one of my colleagues, Dr. Shin Miata, did a propensity scored analysis of the nationwide CAPSNET database and showed that there are definitely cases where it is feasible to not intubate gastroschisis babies. And so the next iteration of our practice bundle has two arms, one where the baby is intubated and one where the baby is not. And for the baby that will not be intubated, sucrose and acetaminophen will be administered. Excellent. Well, I have one more question for you. Um, I did note that uh, the babies that were, had the sutureless closure were not done in the setting of an atresia. What's your preferred management in these patients? Thank you again for the question. And again, I need to clarify, it's not that a sutureless closure is not done for atresia, it's that these babies were not included in the analysis presented today, because we wanted to be comparing apples to apples. For babies that have an atresia that is obvious and not just very severe matting, you know that they will probably be having a second surgery and or an increased anesthetic time. So we thought that this would lead to slightly muddier uh, results and analysis. And I have seen many different ways of managing atresias or perforation depending on the intestines that we see. And I think that that is something that you need to individualize to each gastroschisis baby. I have seen sutureless closures. I have seen fascial closures. I have seen ostomies. Bishop Coop ostomies or anastomoses, depending on the bowel. Excellent. Well, I really thank you for allowing us to 
uh, talk today. And I think this was great information. I really look forward to see where this goes, uh, both in Canada and uh, in America together. So thank you very much. Have a great day. Thank you so much for the privilege. It was a pleasure. All right, take care. Thank you, Drs. Trudeau and Frazier. Our final abstract will be presented by Dr. Christina Theodoro from UC Davis Medical Center. Her presentation is entitled, Discontinuing Antibiotics on Discharge is Safe in Children with Perforated Appendicitis Without Leukocytosis. Thank you for the opportunity to present our work. My name is Christina Theodoro and I'm a Pediatric Surgery Research Fellow at UC Davis. As appendicitis is the most common acute indication for surgical intervention in the pediatric population, it has been the subject of a number of studies aiming to identify the optimal post-operative management strategies. Many patients now receive short durations of oral antibiotics or have antibiotics discontinued on hospital discharge. However, there is evidence that 50% of children with perforated appendicitis still routinely receive antibiotics on hospital discharge. Some studies have found a protective effect of post-discharge antibiotics, while others have found that discontinuing antibiotics on discharge is safe. While some institutions utilize a discharge white blood cell count to determine antibiotic duration, the use of a left shift in determining antibiotic duration has not been reported. We hypothesized that discontinuing antibiotics on discharge in children with a normal white blood cell count and no left shift would be safe. To evaluate this, we modified our clinical practice guideline for pediatric perforated appendicitis. Once patients meet discharge criteria, a complete blood count with differential is sent. Prior to this modification, patients were prescribed oral antibiotics to complete a five-day total course, inclusive of inpatient and outpatient doses. This was changed to discontinue further antibiotics on discharge in the presence of a normal CBC, defined as a normal white blood cell count with no left shift. Patients were included if they were less than 18 years old and had perforated appendicitis managed with appendectomy. Patients were excluded if they were managed with antibiotics alone, percutaneous drainage, or developed a surgical site infection during the index hospitalization, as these patients are managed off the pathway. We compared outcomes in the 12 months before and after CPG modification. Our primary outcomes were adverse events, post-discharge surgical site infections, 30-day emergency department visits or readmissions. Secondary outcomes included rate of antibiotic prescription on discharge, discharge and total antibiotic duration, and CPG adherence. There was no significant change in post-discharge surgical site infections, ED visits, or readmissions in the post cohort. The post-intervention cohort was significantly less likely to receive discharge antibiotics at 21% of patients compared to 77% of patients pre-intervention and for a shorter duration on discharge and in total. Overall CPG adherence remained unchanged. Reasons for non-adherence included not ordering a discharge CBC in one patient, not ordering a CBC with differential in four patients in each cohort and not prescribing the recommended duration of antibiotics. Adherence to the aspect of the CPG, which was modified in this study increased significantly from 57% to 91% post-intervention. In all cases of non-adherence in the pre-cohort, patients received more than five recommended total days of antibiotics. The area with lowest adherence was seen in patients who had a left shift without leukocytosis. Although the CPG states these patients should receive a total 10-day course of antibiotics, this did not frequently occur. We note that no patients with an isolated left shift on discharge developed a post-discharge surgical site infection. In conclusion, modification of a clinical practice guideline for pediatric perforated appendicitis to discontinue antibiotics in patients without leukocytosis or a left shift was associated with significantly shorter antibiotic durations without an increase in adverse events. Further work is needed to evaluate the utility in prescribing further antibiotics in the population of patients with an isolated left shift without leukocytosis. Our results suggest stopping antibiotics may be safe in this group, but our sample size was limited and robust conclusions cannot be drawn. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Theodoro. The invited discussant for this paper is Dr. Faraz Khan from Loma Linda University Children's Hospital. Well, thank you, Dr. Thiruro, for your excellent talk, um, and congratulations to your other co-authors uh, for this excellent work. I have a few questions for you. Uh, first off, for the purpose of this study, how did you guys define perforated appendicitis? 
Thank you for the question. For this study, we defined perforated appendicitis as a visible hole in the appendix at the time of the operation, and that data was extracted from the operative report. Okay. Then secondly, um, in your data set, the readmission rate post CPG modification, while was not statistically different, um, it almost doubled. What are your thoughts on the cause of this? Absolutely. Um, so overall, I think uh, the reason that it wasn't statistically significant is likely because of our small numbers. Um, and this is an area that is ripe for future research in a larger, perhaps multi-center study, um, looking at the same appendicitis clinical practice guideline at multiple institutions. When I looked at the actual numbers, in the pre-cohort, there were three patients that were readmitted, and in the post-cohort, there were five. So the overall numbers remained low. The reasons for readmission included poor PO tolerance in two patients in the pre-cohort and one patient having an abscess requiring a drain placement. And in the post-cohort of those five readmissions, three were for abscesses, um, and then two were for non-infectious related reasons. So there was an increase, but again, I think you need a bigger cohort to really determine if that is going to be something that is a, a significant finding of your the change to your clinical practice guideline. Okay. And then finally, uh, how many patients in the post-modification, no post-discharge antibiotic group have a surgical site infection or need another intervention? Absolutely. So there were 41 total patients in the post-cohort that went home without any additional antibiotics out of the total of 51 patients, I believe. There were three patients that developed a surgical site infection of those 41, and then of those two patients required an intervention. One patient had a drain placed and one patient had an abscess aspirated. The third patient was treated with antibiotics alone and recovered well. Okay, fantastic. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, doctors Theodoro and Khan. This concludes the plenary one session. We thank you for watching and thank all of our presenters and invited discussants. Well, that was an awesome first plenary session of the 2021 APSA. Um, wow. We went over all of pediatric surgery in about an hour and 15 minutes. Gastroschisis, appendicitis, esophageal atresia, bowel obstruction, um, just to name a few. Uh, congratulations to all the authors and their teams for um, really great work. I'm going to ask my partners here, things that you learned that might change your practice or things that sort of were involved or you might have been involved in that you, you're doing differently now than you've done in the past? Yeah, you know, I found that contrast challenge really interesting, and I think uh, we've adopted that, and it's really changed the way you manage kids who come in with adhesive small bowel obstructions. The other thing I thought was really interesting was ultrasound for neck, and I was wondering, I want, do you guys do that at your institution, and does a surgeon do it? Does a radiologist do it? I don't know. i just like to echo what you say. What a great session, great lively discussion in the chat, too. Yeah, absolutely agree. That was really educational, really interesting. Um, I'll kind of comment on what you said. The We do use ultrasound for NAC at our institution. Um, it's not kind of a um, end-all be-all for whether or not we're diagnosing NEC, but it definitely um, is really helpful when evaluating kids who are somewhat um, have an unclear diagnosis. And our radiologists will read the studies, our ultrasound techs perform it, and I found it really helpful. Yeah, I think we're in the same boat with you, Jamie, in that standpoint. From a uh, using a contrast, uh, a water-soluble contrast to help with the diagnosis slash um, treatment of bowel obstruction. We've adopted that here, and it's been a game changer. And I know a lot of the chatter in the chats and questions were getting your radiologist to buy in. I think we really struggled with that here in Cincinnati, um, and getting data and the data presented today hopefully will help some institutions do that. I think some key points are always follow the clinical situation. So mm -hmm. if you need to take the patient to the OR, do not wait for the study. Um, and it's really just having the patient drink some contrast and then getting an image at eight hours after it, And that helps eight to 24 and a 24 hour picture. And that changes our algorithm. At 24 hours, we know what we're doing. And sometimes even at eight hours, we know which direction we're taking our clinical care path. So um, 
just curious what you guys have been doing and any other comments as we start to transition to the next session. Yeah, I agree. I think, um, and just following with x-rays when you do a small bowel follow through on these kids has been really helpful. And um, coming out of my adult training, it was something that we did a lot in my residency. Um, and I think it helped save some, um, some patients in operation if the contrast reaches the colon. I think we got to wrap it up here. And the next section yeah. is going to be on the uh, systematic review of gastrostesis and the APSA QSC toolkit. So we look forward to another great session. Yes, make sure you scroll down to the bottom of your screen on your HOVA, WOVA, WOHOVA. We could get into a whole conversation of what to call it. But on the bottom of your screen should be, if you scroll all the way down, uh, to click to the next session.